Because the whole design world is inexorably feeling its way towards the core principles as we saw in previous videos, there are some solid trends in branding design. Let's talk about it. Losing a weak logo. In recent times, some companies have omitted logos from their identities. In fairness, most of those logos were weak, violating one or more of the seven deadly sins of logo design. But as mentioned in previous lessons, an identity consisting of a signature alone usually only works well for consumer brand products like Gillette, Alka-Seltzer, and CoverGirl, etc. Only a few of the examples here are such businesses. For most of them, a better approach would have been to redesign their logos. Numbers one through four, Charter Communications, Cognizant, First Data, and Scotiabank all got rid of their problematic logos, which were admittedly weak. But the end result in each case is less personality in their identities. Number five, Halliburton's logo was ill-proportioned. The logo was much too big in relation to the signature, and the H was much too small in relation to the circle. But otherwise, it was an adequate logo. The worst part of the identity was the use of an extended font for an already long signature. Unbelievably, that is the only part they kept. Throw away the better part and keep the weaker part. What were they thinking? Number six, losing a logo isn't always a bad idea. Dunkin' Donuts shortened its name and its identity to Dunkin' Alone. Removing the logo was no big loss as it wasn't very memorable. They kept the very appropriate font and the net result was quite positive. Number seven, SanDisk threw away their logo, which was somewhat uninspired and had very thin positive and negative lines. They also switched to a slab serif font to give the word mark more mass. All in all, a good move for them. Number eight, Fujifilm finally got rid of its horrible logo and replaced its signature with a word mark. Again, another change for the better. Number nine, Black & Decker's decision to change its identity is baffling. The logo was solid. The signature font had fairly small counters that might fill in at small sizes, so it could have been replaced with another sturdy font with counters that were a bit more open. The ampersand did not fit the rest of the type and also needed to be replaced, but overall it wasn't a bad identity. It had a feeling of strength that could have served them well with some adjustments. When they changed the new identity, they lost the sturdy look and added shallow containment for what can only be described as a much weaker identity overall. Plain signatures are inherently weaker than a good logo or monogram with a signature or a word mark. In spite of the previous examples, losing the logo in general is not a trend in 21st century identity design. Instead, as we have seen in the preceding several lessons, companies and their designers are feeling their way towards the core principles that are the foundation of this course. That ought to tell you something. A move away from serif fonts. When talking about thin shapes, we have concentrated on logos, but the same principles apply to the fonts used for the signatures or word marks in identity design. Serifs are, in most fonts, smaller and thinner than the strokes that make up the main letter forms. Many companies have found these problematic. This is why so many companies are moving away from serifs in their signatures and word marks. If you go back through the last several videos, you will see how many font changes have gone from serif to sans serif. The one part of the serif world that is still useful are the slab serifs, because the serifs tend to be sturdier. As a practical experiment, go back through the lessons in this section and see how serif and humanist fonts have been abandoned in favor of sans serif. Number 10, AIG left behind their serifs with their new sans serif identity. Number 11, Stockholm Stad, the municipality of Stockholm, Sweden, replaced its wraparound serif type with straight sans serif that has a bit more weight. They also simplified their coat of arms to be one color. 
HSBC increased the size of their logo relative to their signature and compensated by using a cleaner sans serif font with heavier weight. Number 13. Reader's Digest joins the host of other companies abandoning their former serif word marks with a clean sans serif one. Number 14. Travelers shortened their name as well as going to a sans serif font with a single color umbrella logo. Number 15. NVIDIA traded its two color logo as well as its lower uppercase mix and its regular and italic mix for a single color logo with a sturdy sans serif signature. Didone is dead. A subset of serif fonts that are even more problematic are the Didone family. They are represented by such fonts as Badoni, Modern, Dido, etc. Because of their thick and thin strokes, especially in their serifs, they have long been avoided by identity designers with good reason. Those thin strokes fill in too often to be viable for branding design. For those few times when they have been used, the lifespan of those designs has been short, having been replaced by fonts that do not have such thick, thin properties. While fine for other uses, they are not suitable for identity design. Many designers have tried to ignore this fact over the years and use them anyway, but none have succeeded. Are you listening, Gap? These are not the only good trends in 21st century identity design, but they are representative of how the whole branding design industry is moving toward the core principles of logo design. Those principles transcend fad and fashion. They won't change. They are reliable and have always been the basis of brands that last forever. They are here to stay. For more information, go to logodesigntheory.com. If you found this helpful, be sure to like this video, subscribe, and share this with anyone who needs to know more about logo design.